Welcome everyone to our rescheduled session, a PA Spotlight in Psychiatry with our good friend, Crystal Lopez. She's been here before. So if you're a familiar face, please, uh, or familiar with her, just please say hi in the chat. If you have any questions regarding our program, um, feel free to contact us at virtualshadowing at gmail.com or Instagram at virtual shadowing. As always, these sessions are recorded and put on our YouTube channel, Pre-Health Virtual Shadowing. Let me go to the next slide, if that would want to do that. Fabulous. Okay. After this, we have a specialty spotlight in GI and endoscopy. And then following, we have a PA spotlight in OB-GYN. Um, if you want to hear about our upcoming sessions, uh, stay tuned to our emails and our Instagram for the upcoming calendar. All of those sessions will be on Zoom or YouTube Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, these sessions are brought to you by our wonderful working group comprised of Reagan, Cheyenne, Taylor, myself, Rachel, Mariam, Elena, Ani, Rohit, Kiana, and our four physicians, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Morchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat as we go along. There'll be two Q&As, one in the middle and one at the very end. We will have the quiz information after the last Q&A. Um, so hold all quiz and questions till the very end. Um, and I would like to introduce our wonderful speaker. Uh, Crystal is such a warm and bright personality. She just brings a smile to everyone she sees and uh, she makes me wanna be a better person. So I hope you guys give a warm welcome to Crystal Lopez. Hi. Oh my God, Rachel. That was like, oh, that made my like heart melt. You're so sweet. Thank you um, for having me. So I'm like she said, I'm Crystal. I'm a PA. I work in psychiatry and in family medicine. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you guys for being here. Um, and thank you to the virtual shadowing team for providing this service. Um, we were just talking about how much it's grown and I think it's really awesome because I know it's been really hard this last year for students. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Oh, and also I need to apologize to Dr. Morchetti because I transferred a patient back to him in the ER and I did not realize it was him, like the same Dr. Morchetti. So apologize for that. <laughs> um, so anyways, like, uh, like Rachel said, we're, uh, we'll have some time to ask questions. So if there's anything that you have a question about, um, Rachel, please, I don't know if that's possible, but just stop me in the middle if you want to. It's very, I feel this is very casual. So um, <laughs> anyways, with that being said, we'll go to the outline page so you guys can kind of see what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we'll do a little background on me and then my journey into psychiatry, kind of how I became a PA getting into PA school, what that was like, and then transitioning from primary care, family medicine into psychiatry. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about how I think PAs are gonna be um, utilized in the future with um, kind of as the bridge between medicine and psychiatry. Um, and then of course, Q and A's, and then um, a day in the life of a psychiatry PA. So I work in emergency um, psychiatry, so we'll get into that. Um, so right now I am full time at the psychiatric emergency department at Parkland Hospital here in Dallas. Um, so we are considered a safety net hospital. And so that's kind of, um, we're like the medical center for patients who don't have any insurance um, or who can't afford to pay. Uh, we will see all of those patients. And I believe Dr. Fowler was just telling me we're actually one of the busiest um, ERs in the country. So I work on the psychiatric side of that. Um, and so we definitely have a high volume of patients. We have a high acuity of patients. Um, they're very sick, um, have a lot of different um, pathologies that we see. So you know, that's my full-time job. And I do that Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. I um, also work in family medicine. So I do probably one to two shifts a month in family medicine. I do what's called locum tenens. Um, and so locum tenens is essentially like PRN work. So it's, 
I work for a company that works for a clinic. This clinic, when it needs help, um, maybe they're busy or maybe somebody's going to call out like a provider. Um, they just need extra coverage. Um, they'll call me and ask if I'm available to work a shift, if I want to work that shift. Um, and I can either say yes or no and make some extra money um, or or not. So that's locum tenens. And I think in Latin, it actually translates to um, to hold the place of. Uh, so that's what that means. I didn't know what that was until like a couple of years ago when I started looking into this type of work. Um, it's pretty uh, useful kind of in that interim phase. Like I was in the middle of changing jobs and I wasn't ready to commit full like full time to, to a place. Um, so that was uh, a good option for that. Um, I think my headphones are about to die. Hold on, let me take these off. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And some of the students are okay. already <laughs> loving you. They're like first okay. generation represent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I put that because I think it's important just because um, I representation. Um, I did not know a lot of people who were first generation college students. I didn't know a lot of people who were first generation um, healthcare workers. A lot of people who were pre med or pre PA at school had you know parents that were in the field or who had somebody you know that some kind of connection. Um, and so that was not me, that was not my case. And I felt a little isolated in that way, but I just wanted to put that out there that you are not alone. Like that is my history as well. Um, so it's possible. Um, oh, oh, back to my jobs. <laughs> I also do community healthcare. So I don't get paid to do that. That's a volunteer job. Um, I do that probably one Saturday a month. Well, one shift a month, it's about four hours. Um, I'll go and see uh, patients in the community. And that job is really cool because um, it's, it's a population similar to what we would see at uh, Parkland. Um, it's patients who are homeless, who don't have access to healthcare, who can't afford healthcare. Um, we see a lot of immigrants and we see a lot of um, like refugee patients. So it's, uh, it's a really cool opportunity to learn and it's also a really good opportunity to give back just to the community. Uh, there's also a lot of medical students that go and volunteer there. So I get to mentor them um, and they get to teach me things, which is kind of cool. Uh, so that's what I do uh, kind of right now. That's, that's my life uh, full time in the emergency room. I'm doing locum tenums kind of one to two times a, a week or a month, depending on, on how busy I am and then volunteering at the Agape Clinic downtown. So that's uh, me right now. And all of this is done in Dallas, Texas, where I've been born and raised. Um, and I, I think being, um, growing up in a city like Dallas, that's kind of heavily populated with a lot of need and there's not a lot of uh, resources really influenced my decision to go into not just medicine, but into a field that was going to allow me to um, to bring change into my community. Um, so I think that was a kind of a driving force for me deciding to go into medicine. Um, but we can go to the next slide. I forgot what. Um, okay, so my kind of journey into psychiatry. Uh, first, I had to become a PA. So that uh, was a little bit of an atypical route for me. I uh, graduated with a degree in neurobiology from the University of Texas in Austin. And um, I went down that route because I took a intro to psych course and I fell in love with psychiatry. I didn't know what I was gonna do with that uh, degree exactly. I just knew I wanted to study the brain. Um, I didn't exactly wanna study psychology because I was more interested in kind of uh, with like the harder science. Um, so the neurobiology side of it. Uh, so I ended up doing a year of research for a PhD candidate. Um, so we did genetic testing um, on larvae which was really fun. <laughs> um, it was really interesting, but just the day-to-day -day aspects of working in the lab was not what I expected it to be. 
So I, I didn't really enjoy it. Uh, ultimately, I, from there, I decided, you know, what am I going to do with this degree in neurobiology? How am I going to continue to study the brain? Um, I ended up, I was going to, deciding I was going to go to medical school. So I was pre-med, I was studying for the MCATs, and I graduated with my degree, and then I needed clinical experience. Um, and that is really where I changed courses entirely. I started working as a scribe in the emergency room. Um, and so there I got to work with MDs, DOs, PAs, nurse practitioners. Um, and from there, so I really learned what a PA was. So um, that really changed my, my course. I learned that PAs got to do exactly what a lot of the MDs and DOs were doing. Um, they were younger, so <laughs> to me that just meant they got to work quicker, they got to the field faster. Um, so I really liked that aspect of it because uh, I was going to be paying for school myself. So, um, you know, doing four years of medical school and then four years of residency and, and accumulating that much debt uh, seemed less appealing to me than uh, going to PA school for just two years. Um, and then getting to the workforce pretty quickly. So that was a, a big uh, reason that I switched. Another reason was um, they didn't have to commit to one field. So we were in the emergency room, but a lot of the PAs would work in um, other areas. They had jobs in clinics, they had jobs in um, other community healthcare centers. So they were doing other things outside of their full-time job. So I really liked that aspect of it. Um, so that was kind of when I decided to switch, okay, I'm not gonna do medical school. I really wanna become a PA because one, I, I like cost and two, I can't commit to just one specialty. So <laughs> um, so that was, that was my, um, my determining factor. And then I had to, do, um, had to get more healthcare experience. So PA school, I think um, one way that it's different from medical school is that they really put a lot of weight on healthcare experience. So getting out into the field, <clears throat> whether it's paid work, whether it's volunteering, whether it's research, um, something that shows you have put yourself out there, you've done, you know, um, you've done patient care, you've interacted with patients, because I think it's really hard to know that you like something without actually doing it. Um, and so with PA school only being two years, you don't have as much time to figure out if you like medicine or not. <laughs> um, so having that experience before coming to PA school, I think is really helpful. Um, and so, so that's what I did. I, I switched from being a scribe into doing something a little bit more hands-on. Um, I became an ophthalmology assistant, um, so a scribe slash technician. So that was really cool. I got to um, scribe, but I also got to assist in a lot of surgeries that we did in, um, in the office. Um, so it was a retina specialist and a glaucoma specialist. And so there were hands-on things I got to assist with. Um, so that was really fun. Um, and that's, I think, a, a job that you don't necessarily think about as healthcare experience, um, counting towards you know, your application. So I like to point that out that, you know, being an ophthalmology technician or an ophthalmology scribe is something you can do um, without having really any kind of certification. Uh, I applied as the only background I had was having an, um, been a scribe in the emergency department. So uh, I just sold myself on my cover letter <laughs> and said, hey, I've been a scribe. I, you know, am determined to, to figure it out. And so I think that really worked for me. Um, so anyway, so look into being an ophthalmology scribe if you're having trouble finding healthcare experience. Um, also, you don't have to do too many things um, like uh, that are gross, you know? <laughs> so ophthalmology, I think, is a very um, easy field. Like you're, there's not a lot of blood. There's not a lot of um, guts and stuff. So, so that was kind of cool, too. Um, so anyways, I... I did that for about four years. Um, in the meantime, I was also having to do uh, prerequisites for PA school, which I did at community college. So I point that out just to say, you know, even if, even though I had this four-year degree, I ultimately should like decided, you know, I wasn't going to do MD school and did PA school instead. So um, 
I had to do these prerequisites. So my timeline was a little different. Um, and I still ended up going to, um, you know, a community college, but it didn't really affect the, my course in the long run. Um, so anyways, you, I say that just all of that to say, you're not on anybody's timeline, but your own. <laughs> um, and community college is awesome. I think it'll save you a lot of money. So um, then we can go to the next slide. Uh, we had a quick question. What would you recommend with COVID to look for jobs to gain healthcare experience or patient care experience? Um, I think right now, I, it's, I know it's really difficult, um, but if you can reach out to people, um, you know, I know reaching out to providers, just sending emails, um, people in your community, they may be willing to take you on if they're in more of a smaller clinic, if you're vaccinated, if they're vaccinated, if they've got stuff in place. Um, I think it may be harder to get into like uh, bigger institutions like hospitals um, because there may be more restrictions. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would reach out, just me, my thinking, I really have no idea. <laughs> um, but I would rec recommend like reaching out to just people kind of locally. Um, because I know, I mean, people, you still need a job, right? Like, mm -hmm. like we still need to continue, these clinics still need to be up and um, running. So uh, I know a lot of MAs are still working. I know a lot of Let me mute them. Okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, like Crystal says, just, you know, email everyone. I think that's, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is you get a no. Yeah, exactly. Just put yourself out there. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so this is about getting into BA school. I just did this kind of briefly because I figure there's a ton of information out there on how to get into PA school, um, what exactly the requirements are. Um, and then I think the last presentation I did also talks about this pretty in depth. So um, just briefly, you know, look at each program individually, whatever school you're considering, go to that website, go to that school, look at what they're requiring. Most of the coursework is the same it's like your basic sciences but there may be some things that are different um, so make sure you're looking at your individual schools and then healthcare experience versus patient care experience um, the the difference there is actually like hands-on so for me as an ophthalmology technician i it was considered health care experience and not necessarily patient care experience because i wasn't directly caring for the patient they weren't under me as a provider um, whereas a friend of mine who was an athletic trainer had patients under her care. Um, and so that's considered patient care experience. So that's a little bit of the difference there. Um, and some schools require both. Some require one versus the other. Um, it just depends on the program. So look into that um, specifically for the school you want. I only had healthcare experience and luckily the program I ended up applying to only required like 500 hours of healthcare experience. Um, so that was fortunate for me, that, that was the way to go. So um, I, I, um, they also want, they also separate volunteering and shadowing hours from healthcare experience and patient care experience. So specifically look at what they want in that aspect too. Um, Cause I know some people think volunteering counts and it doesn't always. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and then your letter of recommendations, you know, make sure you are reaching out to people who actually know you, who can not just put a bunch of adjectives on a piece of paper and, and say, yes, I validate for this person, but to really give some insight into who you are as a person and how you may contribute to healthcare in a meaningful way. I think those really go a long way um, because all of you guys are going to have really great, you know, healthcare experience, right? All of you guys are going to have really good GPE or GPA scores, um, GRE scores. All of you guys are going to have a lot of the things that are pretty similar. Um, and so I think these letters of recommendations are a really good way to stand out um, from everybody else is having someone really give insight into um, how you, how you are as a person. <laughs> um, and then the applications, oh, and the GRE and the PCAT. So the PCAT is something new. I don't know too much about that. I do know it is a 
new um, like test that's going to be either required by some schools or recommended by some schools in addition to or in lieu of the GRE. So look into the program that you <clears throat> are interested in and see what they require. Um, and then your applications, there's a ton of different deadlines for different schools. So make sure you're starting early. The CASPA website is really good at, it's like a central location for a bunch of different schools. So you can start working on that. Um, and then make sure you're paying your fees. The fees, uh, the, the fees, the fees um, start to add up. So make sure just kind of prepare for that in advance. I think you can apply for waivers and stuff, but just be prepared that when you're submitting these applications, there is a cost to them. So that's that and one. It's pricey, App applying is pricey. Yeah, it's very expensive, but I, I know there's some, some schools offer waiver and I think the CASPA also offers a waiver too. That's good. And I think that um, CASPA is about to open up for the next cycle. Um, so I know it's the, it just closed for this previous cycle, but so for next year that it's about to open. So start looking into that. Um, so, okay, so once you apply, then you get in. Um, and choosing a school for me, I just want to say what my only recommend or requirements was that I could, um, that I was somewhere that I could get financial support in or like housing. <clears throat> so we were currently, we were at the time living in Phoenix. So I applied to schools in Phoenix and then I have family here in Dallas. So I applied to schools in Dallas. Um, so that's how I ended up at Northern Arizona University. It's actually their medical campus is in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so I got in there. Um, they offered me a spot kind of right after my interview. <clears throat> and I took it because I wanted to be close to home. And it's a 24 month program. So schools will range from 24 months to 36 months, just depending on the program. Um, ours is 24 months all the way through no breaks. <laughs> the first year is all of didactic year. So that means you're mostly in classroom settings, you're sitting, going over PowerPoints after PowerPoint after PowerPoint, um, doing a lot of studying, you're learning how to take a history, you're um, do some hands-on stuff towards the end of didactic year where you learn how to intubate, you'll learn how to suture. Um, <clears throat> so that's all done in the first year. And then the second part of PA school is all the clinical. So everything that you've learned you take and apply that to the real world. And um, we are modeled after medical schools. So you have to do all the core um, rotations. So like primary care stuff and surgery, um, and then like the big uh, cardiology and um, pulmonology, I believe is another one. Um, and then you have room for electives. And so luckily for me, um, psychiatry was an elective that I chose. Um, and it was done at a methadone clinic that was uh, in Tucson, Arizona. And then the other half of it was done in a crisis response center. So they were kind of like an emergency room for uh, patients that were having mental health crisis. So that was my first experience with psychiatry, actually working in psychiatry with patients that were really sick. So if you're interested in psychiatry, if you're interested in a certain field of medicine, when you're doing that clinical year um, and you have the opportunity to take an elective, that would be the time to, to kind of explore. Um, and so once you're done with your clinicals um, and you, you've done all your testing and you take your boards, which is the pants, um, and so that'll get you certified nationally and so that way you can practice and get your license um, in whatever state you choose. Uh, we actually have a question. So once you're in PA school, is that when you figure out like what field do you want to go into and apply straight out? Or like, do you have to do anything special to go into special fields? Um, yeah, so and I think I might talk about that a little bit on the next slide too. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, in PA school, so we're trained as general general practitioners. So just like in medical school, we have to go through kind of every specialty of medicine. And um, in that time, you, you kind of are figuring out what you like and what you don't like. But as PAs, we don't have to choose a specialty. Um, it's not like in medicine where you choose a residency and then you're committed to that for you know, however many years. 
Um, or in nurse practitioner school, you kind of have these different tracks where if you're going to do psychiatry, you're only doing psychiatry. Or if you're doing, um, you know, women's health, you can only do women's health. Um, in PA school, or as PAs, we kind of have the ability to go into whatever field we'd like. And really, the only requirement is, can you get a job there? <laughs> so uh, that's the cool aspect, I think, about PA school is when we're trained in, in all the fields. Um, and then once you graduate, you can go into directly into whatever field you want. Um, so for me, I graduated and went directly into family med and internal medicine. So I think that's on the next slide. Yeah. And then quick question before we move on. Sure. Um, once you take the pants, do you have to take a specific license test in each state to practice in each state? So I think the requirements for each state are different. In Texas, we do have to take an extra test um, kind of on the laws of practicing medicine. It's super easy though. They give you a study guide. It's not anything um, difficult, but it is an extra step that you have to take um, to, to finally get your license. And then uh, I know like in Arizona, you don't, there's no extra testing. You pay a fee, you make, uh, fill out the application and that's it. Gotcha, cool. All right, next slide. Sorry. Okay. Um, so like I said, I graduated PA school and then I started working first in internal medicine. And then uh, the last two years I did pre uh, family medicine, so primary care. Um, and I will say after I graduated PA school, it took me about six months to get a full time, my first like full time position. Um, again, just pointing that out to say you are not on anybody's timeline, but your own. <laughs> so I know some, uh, some of my classmates were kind of freaking out that they didn't have a job right after PA school. Um, like they didn't have anything lined up and it's, it's not a big deal. You will find work. You may have to work in a job that you don't particularly, um, want to do for the rest of your life, but you will have a job. <laughs> and then, um, in that time, I also got to like travel and stuff. So, you know, six months off is not a, a bad thing. But anyways, I did uh, two years in family med and I loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. I, I still enjoy it, which is why I still do it. But, um, you know, COVID happened in March of 2020 and my little tiny family med clinic that I was working at was not prepared to handle this pandemic. Um, we unfortunately didn't have any PPE. We didn't have any testing supplies. It was just a kind of a dangerous situation overall. Um, so I ended up going on a furlough, um, of course, because we weren't seeing as many patients either. So not enough money coming in either. Um, and so in that time, I'm kind of questioning what's going to happen with my career, what's going to happen with my job, is my position safe? Um, when is this going to end? How long is this going to last? You know, all the things that we were all kind of panicking about with, with COVID. And so in that time, I decided to kind of look for um, safer options. And my friend was actually working in outpatient psychiatry at the time. And so he had really recommended that this is something I should consider because I can do it through telemedicine, um, which seemed like the really the only safe option um, at this time. Uh, so that was kind of how I decided to start transitioning into psychiatry was originally looking just to do telemedicine. Um, and then this position for psychiatric emergency department showed up online and it sounded really fun. Um, and so on a whim, I kind of applied and ended up getting the position. Um, so I do want to point out that uh, furlough is something that may happen to you in, in medicine when, um, or, or in any job, essentially, when you have to take a leave of absence, um, you may not get paid for this. Um, so that was just something that kind of happened in case you don't know what that is. Um, and then telemedicine, in case you don't know what that is, is doing virtual visits. Um, so psychiatry has really um, flourished in that field, I think, it, since COVID has happened. I know I'm seeing an online therapist. I know a lot of my friends have switched to online therapy. Um, so I think that is something that's kind of really cool that happened um, during COVID. But anyways, that's telemedicine. Um, and then I also wanted to point out that you, the, the power of a cover letter, again, it was something that I used to kind of sell my experience and frame it in a way that 
shows, hey, I can do this job. Um, I may not have any experience in psychiatry, but this is the experience I do have, and this is how I think it can um, work well in this position. So, you know, without having any experience in psychiatry, really, I was able to transition from family medicine into psychiatry based on, you know, kind of how I presented myself. So I just wanted to put that out there for for you guys, like some people say cover letters don't work. I disagree. <laughs> um, oh, and then I'll, there's another way you can transition to another field is doing fellowships, um, which I, I had heard about, but it wasn't something that I was ever interested in doing. Um, but you can do, uh, it's an extra year after PA school of training in um, specialties. Usually it's, uh, I know urology has one, emergency psychiatry does have one. Um, and I want to say maybe pediatrics, but uh, that is a way to kind of extend your training after PA school if you were interested in doing that. Gotcha. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I stop me if I'm like babbling or if I'm going over for running out of time. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're good on time. Um, okay, good. Um, Okay, so we'll talk about emergency psychiatry, what I do. What is it exactly? Um, I know I get that question a lot. So uh, that we'll go ahead and get into that. Um, let me get my notes here. So um, emergency psychiatry uh, is essentially what it sounds like, right? It's, it's when some, there is a psychiatric emergency or what I like to call a mental health crisis. Um, so they occur when a patient is a danger to themselves, a danger to others. When they're so psychiatrically impaired, uh, the patient cannot provide for their own food, for their own clothing, for their own shelter. Um, they just really can't take care of themselves at all. Um, or if they appear to be at risk of going down any one of these paths, then those are considered psychiatric emergencies. Um, and so those are the types of situations that we deal with in the uh, emergency psychiatry department. Um, so some of the uh, things that you'll see are kind of the most common uh, things that we see, which I think are on the next slide, Rachel, please, um, is of course, a lot of patients having suicidal ideation. So patients wanting to kill themselves, wanting to harm themselves in some way or another. Um, we see a lot of mania, which is um, and patients who are very elevated, who you know have trouble, haven't slept in several days, and we see a lot of agitation. Patients who are coming in very upset, very distressed. Um, so we also see a lot of medical conditions that can cause people to have psychosis, um, a lot of severe anxiety. So a wide range of different things. Um, but as you can see, any one of these things can quickly cause a patient to become a danger to themselves or to somebody else. Um, and so this is what you're mostly dealing with um, in an emergency psychiatry situ situation. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Yes. Um, so if you're wondering what kind of uh, situation you're, you're getting into in the emergency psychiatry department, um, the population, I think, is is the biggest thing. Um, it's an indigent population, so what that means is patients who are experiencing severe poverty, um, who don't have access to uh, mental health services or to insurance, or who really kind of can't afford um, to pay for any kind of mental health service. Um, so that's the kind of patient you're you're going to be working with mostly. Um, and then especially at the hospital that I'm at, at County Hospital, that's the main type of patient that we have. Um, and then again, you're seeing high acuity patients. So these are patients who have serious mental illness. So not just, you know, depression and anxiety, but these are patients who are having severe psychosis from things like schizophrenia, who are just so severely detached from reality um, that they're, they're at harm of endangering themselves or somebody else. Um, we also see a lot of cases of uh, substance abuse. We see a lot of, lot of substance abuse. Um, and so these patients can come in very, very agitated, um, very, very sick. Um, and so that's the kind of case that you're gonna be, you're getting a lot of. Uh, we also work very closely with law enforcement and uh, with social workers. So a lot of our population, our demographic of patient 
um, there's a lot of layover with um, the type of patient or person that a law enforcement person will would would interact with. Um, ever since psychiatry has moved away from institutionalized institutionalization, um, which is where they were kind of housing people in these asylums, uh, they, they've, um, there's now an increase in these patients going into jails. So unfortunately, that's kind of the crossover there is um, not enough mental health resources and patients that end up going, getting arrested for things um, in their moment of crisis or in, in psychosis. So we work very closely with law enforcement um, and then social workers who um, can help patients get things like housing um, or get access to their uh, medications. Um, a cool program that we have at our hospital is called Right Care. And Right Care, let me get this right, stands for Rapid Integrated Group Healthcare Team. And their goal is to divert patients from get it, coming to the ER or for, from getting arrested. Um, and they try to stabilize the patient on the scene. So it's a social worker and a police officer who get called out to somebody having a, potentially, uh, mental, a potential mental health crisis. Um, and they go out and try to stabilize the patient and try to prevent them from escalating and needing to come into the emergency room or, or go into a, a jail setting. So I think that's a really cool cool um, part of our job is, is um, preventing patients from uh, going into a place that potentially could uh, ruin their life or make the situation worse. Um, and then also, it, this, it's a job that's kind of high impact. I, uh, I think you can do a lot of good for a lot of people. Uh, and it's a job that not a lot of people really want to do. <laughs> um, so I think if you're willing to do it, if you're interested, uh, we would love to have you. <laughs> uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Unless there's questions, I don't. Uh, uh, I think we're good for right now. I'll let you know if there's a really good question to insert. <laughs> okay. Um, so some of the benefits of working in emergency psychiatry, um, like I said, the potential to really impact the lives of others. I think um, in mental health, there's a lot of issues that uh, policy wise, there's a lot of issues uh, systemically that I know that I may not as a single person be able to um, affect change in that way. But I think my kindness and my ability to show up for my patients um, on a day to day basis, it can really impact their lives going forward. Um, actually, Dr. Fowler and I were talking about this right before this started is just showing patients um, that there is still a, a helping hand, that there's still someone that cares that is there for them at uh, kind of their lowest point. Um, so for me, that's one of the biggest benefits of working in emergency psychiatry. Um, it's also really intellectually stimulating. So if you like investigating, if you like trying to figure things out, if you like um, kind of delving into the situation, um, this is a really good field to go into. Uh, there's a lot of overlap too between a lot of different psychiatric issues. So trying to narrow down what exactly is happening in somebody's mind is really um, is really challenging. And I, I enjoy that part of the job a lot. So uh, also, you know, if you have a patient who comes in that's psychotic, um, that you can't get a lot of information from that patient. So having to do some kind of investigative work as far as like looking back into their history, looking back into their charting, um, getting a hold of somebody who knows them well, when we call that collateral information. So being able to like uh, get an idea of what's going on with this patient without getting the information from the patient um, is kind of a cool, um, a cool part of my job. So I really like that. Um, and then we're also very team oriented um, <laughs> every patient that I see, typically I will have a social worker with me. So I always have somebody there who has my back. I have somebody who I can bounce ideas off of. Uh, I also work really closely with a lot of the attendings in uh, the department. So there's always somebody to discuss cases with. Uh, we also do shift work. So I will have uh, 12 hours where I'm in charge of taking care of these patients and then the next shift will come over and get those same amount of patients. So we have to be 
cohesive. We have to be on the same team to be able to provide the, say, the best care for this patient. Uh, so I really like the team orientation of that. And uh, again, there's lots of learning opportunities because I am surrounded by so many great attendings um, and they also have residents. Um, and it, it's just a really good opportunity for learning at, uh, um, at every turn, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, sorry, we have a quick question. Uh, yeah, how are your responsibilities different from uh, the physicians or the attendings that you're working with? Um, they're not actually <laughs> at all right now. They're pretty much exactly the same. Um, I think one of the only differences that I can think of is we have a, um, a team where we have uh, a position called triage. So there's a provider who will kind of uh, delegate who sees which patient and in which order. Uh, and a, a physician is the only one who can do that. But for the most part, there is no difference between what I do and what the attendings do um, in the psychiatric emergency department. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and Oh, I, I think the other thing that's cool about working in the ED is it's an emergency room, right? So there's always something to do. There's always something happening. There's always patients coming in. So you, there's never really a dull moment. There's, it, it's fun. It's exciting. It's stressful, <laughs> but uh, I really enjoy doing it. I, I enjoy always having something to do. Um, and then shift work is, is really cool too. So shift work is you know, having a 24 hour service available. Um, and what we typically do work is 12 hour shifts. So I'll do three days of 12 hour shifts and then I'm off the rest of the week. So uh, shift work I think is kind of fun to do also. So those are some of the benefits of emergency psychiatry if you're interested. And then um, some of the, um, we we'll talk about some of the uh, difficulties which you can imagine <laughs> what those might be. Um, so I put this kind of infographic here about the statistics just to kind of show that how much mental health has grown in the last year. And when I say it's grown, I mean how many people have suffered um, more in this last year. Um, we've got, you know, 90% of adults experience an, a mental health illness with over 1.5 million increase in the last year. So there's a lot, a lot of patients um, suffering. So that means we get a lot of patients <laughs> in our emergency service. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of charting that needs to be done. Um, I spend most of my night in front of a computer, whether that's um, researching on the patient, like looking back through their history, um, or if that's just writing up a note. Um, and I think in psychiatry, our charting tends to be a lot longer and a lot more detailed than some of the other specialties uh, because you have to justify so much of what you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to say this patient had high blood pressure, I'm treating with this medication, here's the blood pressure numbers. But in psychiatry, you have to prove that this patient is having mood, a legitimate mood disorder, um, and here's the evidence why. Um, and most of the time that evidence is things that the patient has done, pa things that are going on in the patient's life. Um, so our notes tend to be a little bit more detailed, a little bit more, um, a little longer. <laughs> so <laughs> a, lot, a lot of charting to do. Um, and then the other part of working in the emergency room setting is having to work nights, having to work weekends and having to work holidays. We are never closed. So uh, you're gonna work whenever you have to work, <laughs> unless you're asking for a day off, you know, we're always open. Um, so uh, you do get paid extra for that. That's, they, that's something that they do for you. But if you don't have a, a problem, then you'll be fine. And then the big, a, a big thing that's been an issue for me lately is, is the limited resources and the limited funding in psychiatry. Um, there's not, a, one, people in general don't have access to, to healthcare. Um, and still insurance does not, wants to separate mental health and behavioral health care from medical health care. So it's hard to get coverage. Um, it's hard to find therapists. It's hard to find psychiatrists. It's hard to get medications covered. 
Um, and a lot of the population that I work with do, just does not have that. Um, and so funding is very, very limited. Um, resources are very, very limited. Uh, it's most of my patients who go to some of the um, lower income clinics have to wait months and months to get in to see a provider. So I think that is one of the biggest difficulties that we have in the emergency room is we can stabilize the patient, you know, for the short time, but are they able to go in and follow up with the provider in a, in a reasonable amount of time so that they can continue that stability? Um, and, and often they're not, and that's really frustrating. Um, I think mental health policy issues are also um, a source of frustration uh, in, in our field. There, uh, like I was telling Dr. Fowler and Rachel, uh, in outpatient setting, you can watch a patient kind of spiral downwards, you know, in, the, in a state of psychosis or in a state of mania, they may not tend to their responsibilities at home. They may start to lose their job. They may not be able to pay their bills. They lose their home. Um, they lose their children. So, but none of these things at times are enough for us to say, hey, by law, you have to take your medication or hey, by law, we're gonna have to put you in the hospital. Um, and so I think that can be very difficult um, to, to, to watch a patient go through that in, in psychiatry. Um, so a lot of mental health policy, I think that needs to be, be changed. Um, and, and I think that also contributes to, to the lack of funding. Um, there's a lot of policy that um, it, it makes it difficult for us to get adequate funding for patients in mental health care. Um, and then of course, like with any job, um, it can be very stressful um, and it can be emotionally challenging. Um, dealing with patients, psychiatry or in, you know, family medicine or whatever field you go into is ultimately dealing with, with people. <laughs> um, and so it's just like having any job where you are in customer service, whether you're serving ice cream or wringing people's clothes up. Um, it's, it's about treating people with that respect and dignity um, and knowing that people are going to push your buttons. Uh, people mm -hmm. are emotional beings. <laughs> yeah. um, and then especially in psychiatry, I think that is uh, tenfold. <laughs> I can only imagine. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, how do you deal with patients that are hostile or aggressive? Um, so I think one thing that I I've heard it described this way in a podcast one time, and I think it's the perfect way to, um, to reiterate that as when you're approaching a patient that's hostile or that's agitated or that's um, upset is to go in there um, without guns blazing, um, you know, go in there with a, a more of a gentle approach. Um, you know, you don't want to have to, you don't want to add fuel to a fire. So my approach is to um, kind of just be neutral um, and hold space for that patient because they're going through something. Um, patients aren't agitated and upset for no reason. There's something else going on. So to try to remember that they're sick, they're there to get help, um, that really helps me deal with the situation in front of me as opposed to getting caught up in the emotions. Yeah. Um, we also have a question. How do you deal with your own mental health to like prevent burnout? Do you like compartmentalize uh, patients' worries so you don't have to worry about them off the clock? Um, I think that's kind of the nice thing about emergency medicine is that when you're off the clock, you're off the clock. Um, there's really not much um, to do once you go home. Some cases do tend to stick with me, but I think what I practice the most is mindfulness and being present. Um, and so that helps me kind of uh, deal with the situation at hand in the moment and then not let that carry over into the rest of my day. Um, I think I also try to uh, hold space for a patient as much as I can. Um, and then recognizing when I need to take time for, my, for myself, recognizing when my emotions are getting elevated or when my, um, you know, when I'm starting to become triggered, <laughs> then I need to take that moment to like walk away um, and, 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 you know, regroup before I can go and talk to a patient again. So I think it's about being aware um, and then also uh, just, routine. Um, you know, I, like I said, I routinely get up and meditate and I routinely will go running. Um, it's just priority, prioritizing your own mental health. Um, you kind of, you can't pour from a, a, an empty glass. So make sure yours is full. 
Beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any, is there any other questions? Uh, I think we can move on. Okay, cool. Sorry, sometimes Zoom and PowerPoint doesn't want to work together. Okay. <laughs> Um, oh, so okay, so some things you to consider um, if you're interested in going into psychiatry, um, things you can probably do now as a student, um, as an undergraduate student, um, things that I would recommend um, is getting experience. Uh, if you have never worked with uh, patients that are mentally ill, that can sometimes be very jarring to people, especially patients who are severely mentally ill, patients who are psychotic, it's not something you see very every day. So if that's something you're interested in, get experience, whether it's being a mental health technician, whether it's volunteering. Um, a lot of our pep population, um, like I said, is an indigent population. So very impoverished. A lot of them are homeless. So volunteering at like homeless shelters um, or shelters in general, <laughs> um, places like soup kitchens, um, just interacting with this community, this demographic, to kind of get an idea of if this is something you enjoy doing, or these people you enjoy being around it. And it's okay if you don't, right? I mean, you know, I'm not, like, nobody is going to think less of you, but um, you want to know that before you commit. So I recommend volunteering in, in places like that, um, because you really want to love what you do. You, you want to uh, love that you, going into work, you want to be able to have feel like you're doing um, doing good. You're you're accomplishing something because if you don't love what you do, you're gonna be miserable, and that's not gonna be good for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I think if you want to go into psychiatry, you also have to learn to love yourself. Um, so like you guys were asking, how do I protect my own mental health? Well, I think it starts with loving yourself. Um, and if you don't love yourself, you're not going to take that time to take care of yourself. And if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your patients. So um, that's something to, to kind of start practicing. I think it, that's useful in any field you go into and in anything mm -hmm. you do. Um, and then also practicing kindness. Um, I think, again, for anybody going into medicine, learning how to practice kindness, um, to be intentional about being kind. Uh, is something that'll go a long way when you um, start interacting with patients. These are all beautifully worded things. These are just <laughs> speaking to my soul. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> um, I think, uh, the, okay, and the last thing I want to talk about before uh, I think we do our first Q&A session is um, the PAs being like the bridge between medicine and mental health. So like I said, we are trained in general medicine. So we can treat your blood pressure. We can do a pap smear. We can treat your child when they're sick. Um, so we have this broad knowledge uh, of medicine. Um, and another thing that's really cool about PAs is what's called lateral mobility. So you can, again, we're trained generally, but if I can get a job in one specialty and I can, um, and I like it, then I can, you know, do a specialty, but I can also continue to do general medicine. I've done family medicine and I can transition into psychiatry. Um, I've had uh, friends who are doing urology who are now in dermatology. So that's kind of the cool thing about PAs. And I think that really helps um, in psychiatry and, or in mental health in general, because as a, when I was a family med provider, um, when, I, when I was doing that full time, some of the things I would see a lot was you know, depression, anxiety, um, a lot of mental health issues in primary care. And so I think um, PAs are, are really good at being able to treat kind of both things. Um, and then uh, I think we can improve our access to mental health care uh, as PAs. Uh, we, like I said, we get to work a lot quicker. It's only two years of PA school. So we can fill that gap that's needed right now. There's not enough psychiatrists. Um, there's not enough counselors. There's not enough therapists. And I think PAs can kind of provide um, a little bit of all of that. Um, and uh, I kind of, in my practice now as an emergency um, psychiatry provider, I have patients who, again, are homeless, who haven't seen a provider in who knows how long, mm -hmm. we do blood work, I see some anemia, or I see an infection. These are things I can treat without having to consult medicine or having to consult, um, you know, a, a hepatologist. Uh, that these are things that I've seen in, in my family med practice that I feel comfortable treating in the emergency room setting. 
um, and it's within the scope of my practice and that's something I can do, um, which a lot of the medical um, providers or the attendings like the psychiatrists are kind of at a loss when it comes to the medical side of things. <laughs> so um, that's kind of, I think, where PAs can fit in in, in psychiatry. Awesome. All right, we're to our first Q&A. We have lots of questions. Um, how long was your psychiatry elective rotation in PA school and do you feel like it prepared you for your current job? Um, so our psychiatry like rotation, like all the rest of our rotations are about four weeks long. Um, so I did a month of psychiatry, but I don't think that was enough to prepare me for what I'm doing now. It was a good exposure to see what it was like to work in a mental health crisis center um, and to see what patients look like when they're really sick. I think that was helpful. It was helpful in that way so that when I started working in this job, it wasn't a big shock to me. Mm -hmm. um, but then once I started doing psychiatry, uh, most recently, I actually had uh, two to three months of on the job training where I followed some of the attendings around and I um, was kind of assessed on my ability to, to assess patients. So, um, so it was only four weeks, but it, I think it was helpful in ways that um, as far as just exposure. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then in your field, do you work with any other fields uh, such as like emergency medicine, uh, psychology? Um, yes. So we work with as well. So emergency medicine, we will work closely with um, so emergency psych and emergency medical side. So like Dr. Fowler and I were saying before, you know, we have a lot of patients who use substances um, like alcohol and those can quickly turn into a medical issue. Um, but addiction is a psychiatric issue. So we work closely with the emergency medicine side, the medical side of things. Um, and then we also work really closely with pharmacists. Um, we have a pharmacist in our psychiatric emergency department who helps us kind of pool information about when a patient has filled prescriptions, um, which prescription they think should be filled or should be, um, which is recommended. Um, we also work really closely with a lot of the, um, like anytime we need a consult, sometimes I've had patients who've had really bad kidney function from like long-term use of meth. And so I had to call a kidney specialist down um, so those are some, some of the specialties we work with. Again, I work with a social worker, every single mm -hmm. patient. So that's kind of cool to have, um, her at her, I say her, cause most of them are women, but, um, <laughs> uh, to have her opinion is, is really helpful also. Gotcha. Um, can you speak a little bit about language limitations and barriers in psychiatric care? Can a non-native speaker achieve the level of fluency that meets the unique needs of a non-native English speaker in this type of patient population? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, if I understand this correctly, I, I guess I can give an example. I, have, I speak Spanish, I'm fluent in Spanish, um, and there are some patients who are only Spanish speaking and I have the unique ability to be able to converse with that patient um, and get kind of a whole picture of what's going on um, without the use of a translator. Sometimes there's something lost in, in having that translation there, um, it, but it's not impossible. Our, a lot of our providers don't speak Spanish and they do use a, 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 a translator and, and they're able to get the job done. Um, we also have a lot of patient providers whose first language is not English um, and they still are able to successfully see patients. So I think, um, I think in psychiatry, it, yes, link communication is important, but you have to also remember if you're dealing with the severely mentally ill, they may just be psychotic enough that you're not getting enough, a lot of information <laughs> anyway. So um, anyways, I, I think that uh, overall it's, um, it, it, it is important, but it's not impossible if, you, um, if you're not a native speaker. Chris, uh, let me interrupt. Um, at Parkland, of course, we see not just Spanish, but we also see Amharic, uh, mm -hmm. Ur Urdu, uh, Arabic, Mandarin Chinese, and so forth. What sort of translation services do you use? And can you conduct a psychiatric history in someone with Mandarin Chinese via a translating service? Yeah, so we use um, 
the Albin service, which is a telephone service. You call and you choose whatever service you need and they have somebody on the other line who will translate for you. Um, and so I've used it for French. Um, I've also used the iPad for uh, a American Sign Language. Um, so those have been the most uh, unique. Um, and it was a little more challenging in that you had to be more patient because it was almost essentially two different converse or two conversations <laughs> happening. Um, but it wasn't impossible. It just required a little bit of flexibility on my part, a little bit of patience um, and really clarifying what was meant by what the patient said because you don't want to make sure something isn't lost in translation. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Uh, how much time do you spend with a patient? And then do you get to see them after like they had uh, there in the hospital? Um, so I think it just depends on the situation. It depends on the patient. Um, sometimes our assessments can be as short as 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes they can be as long as 30 minutes to an hour. Um, it just kind of depends on the situation. There are also times when I'm going to see a patient and they are sedated. So that, you know, was a minute long <laughs> in and out. So it just kind of depends. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? Do you get to see patients after? Um, oh, um, so sometimes if patients are admitted to Parkland's psychiatric inpatient unit, then I have access to their records and I can kind of go back and see, follow and see what happened with them. Um, a lot of our patients, unfortunately do return to the emergency room. Um, so I do see them in that sense, um, but to see kind of patients who progress and do well, we hardly, we don't have that opportunity, unfortunately. Do you ever get frustrated when you see patients come back over and over again? Um, I try not to. Um, to say I don't would be a lie, <laughs> but I definitely like to be aware of when I start feeling that sensation because you don't want to go into uh, seeing a patient with this bias, uh, with this preconceived notion of, oh my gosh, here we go again, or why am I even doing this? What are we, why are we even going through this? Um, because then you start to lose hope in that patient, and then the patient starts to lose hope. And once there's no hope, then really there's nothing left to do. So uh, I really try not to get caught up in, in that negativity. Gotcha. It's try to, you know, stay positive. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, I try to be more present as much as I can. So whatever happened, you know, an hour ago or what's going to happen an hour from now doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. um, a student asked, did you have to go through extra training and certification to prescribe a psychiatric drugs? So we are able to prescribe all medications just like with any provider, if you're going to prescribe certain um, scheduled drugs, so these are like controlled substances, like um, things like Xanax or hydrocodone, uh, those are medications that need what's called like a DEA license. So you have to have prescriptive authority. Um, that's not really training. It's more of a uh, $700 license. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a way for the DEA uh, to kind of keep track of you and keep track of what you're prescribing and to who. Um, so, and then there's also something called medical assisted treatment, um, which requires a, a special license called an X license. Um, that's where you help patients get off opioids. So we can uh, treat them with like methadone or suboxone. Um, this, these are for like patients who are heavy um, heroin users or who were addicted to like pain medications who want to get off of that. Um, we use Suboxone or Methadone. And so that requires a special license. And you do have to have some experience um, treating these types of patients before you can get that license. Gotcha. Cool. Well, thanks for letting me know. Um, to what degree has COVID-19 impacted uh, the patients you've seen in your practice? Um, so I think I think I have a kind of a, a broad idea of that because in family medicine, um, I got to see how it affected patients um, kind of when they were doing their best and see how it affected patients who were doing their worst um, in, in the emergency room setting. Um, patients, you know, in the family med setting, I got to see a lot of uh, loss of jobs. I got to see a lot of patients kind of just living in fear really. Um, which was 
really stressful in the beginning, especially not being able to have the, the, uh, the testing that we needed, not being able to provide patients with answers. Um, it, was, it was really hard um, in the beginning, and, and I think patients sensed that. Um, so that was one way they were really affected. And then I think now um, it, it's been hard for patients who utilize community resources um, because, you know, for instance, one of the shelters here in Dallas, when it would have a COVID outbreak, you know, one patient would get positive and it could spread like wildfire among these people because it's such a heavy, heavily populated shelter. Um, and then that shelter was out of commission and we already have limited resources as it is. As it is. So, um, so I think in that way, a lot of the population that comes to the emergency room was affected. Um, their, like their resources were affected. Gotcha. Um, a student asked, um, how does a medical professional go about offering their licensed services in charity or in a volunteer setting? I think you're, you work with the Agape Clinic, correct? Yes. Um, and so that I kind of just reached out. I knew I wanted to volunteer. I wanted to give back. Um, so I looked up uh, community clinics in my area that were looking for volunteers, uh, providers, and I just emailed the director and she was happy to have me on. <laughs> Um, and so once I went and interviewed, then I met with the uh, medical director and the supervising physician. Um, and once they agreed to bring me on, I uh, signed the agreement with them and, and that was it. Awesome. And then last couple of questions before we move on to come some of your case studies. Um, how do you feel about the stigma regarding receiving mental health? Um, what about for those who think that they don't need uh, mental, uh, mental assistance at all? I think um, that's kind of like two different um, arguments there. I think there's two different um, cases there. So mental health stigma, I think as a whole is definitely a, a problem. Um, it's becoming more talked about now. We, we're becoming more focused on mental health, um, you know, self-care and, and those kinds of things. But Mental illness is something completely different, right? Mental illness to me is, uh, is patients who have these serious mental illnesses um, who are at risk of decompensating to the point where they can't care for themselves, where they can become dangerous to other people, um, where they can ruin their lives essentially. Um, and so those are two different types of um, mental illnesses that, that, that need to be treated in a different way. Um, I think patients should have the right to advocate for themselves and for treatment but I also think there's a fine line of um, needing to make sure that these patients are taking medication that can prevent them from, from ruining the rest of their life. Gotcha. And then to go off of that, um, have you ever dealt with patients that don't want help? Yes, um, a lot of patients don't want help, um, especially in substance use. We see a lot of patients who just um, they just are not ready to, to give up yet. They're not ready to change the way they're living. They're not ready to um, put in the effort or, or they're afraid to, or for whatever reason, um, patients can be very resistant to change. Um, also patients who are struggling, struggling with real mental illnesses like schizophrenia or um, you know, other psychosis that cause them to be very paranoid. They can be very distrusting of, of providers and distrusting of medication. Um, and so we see a lot of resistance in that way also. Um, and, it, and it can be hard, um, especially in the emergency room setting. You know, we only have them for such a short amount of time. Um, we, we try our best to in, enforce, you know, you know, education as far as like, hey, this is why we think you should take this. I think this will help with this. Um, but ultimately, you know, there is, there is a process called, you know, medication commitment where a judge can essentially force a patient to, to take a medication, um, but it, it's, it's not something that we, we're, we do in the emergency room setting, um, and it's not something that's done, you know, pretty uh, freely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, gotcha. it, it, that's one of the challenges in, in psychiatry, for sure. Gotcha. Well, I think I'm ready to hear some case studies. Cool. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we'll go. This is just, oh, that's at, right outside of Parkland. That's our hospital. So a day in the life of an ER psych PA is what we'll talk about. Um, I guess I just realized I probably should have said night in the life. <laughs> 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 I work nights. So um, so we'll start with talking about the uh, kind of the
of the process of how patients come to the psychiatric emergency department. So they will usually arrive either voluntary or involuntary. Um, so they come in willingly or either unwillingly by a family member or unwillingly by police. Um, so those are kind of the two ways we get patients to us. Um, they can present directly to what's called psychiatric intake. So that's a part of our psychiatric ER where patients can kind of bypass the main ER and come directly to psychiatry. Um, so patients can show up there either willingly or unwillingly. We get our, our, a lot of police that bring patients in come through that area as well. Um, we can also get consulted by patients or by providers that are treating patients in the main ER. So the medical side of the ER, so where like Dr. Fowler works, um, he'll have a patient who is complaining of, you know, maybe back pain and then says, oh, by the way, I want to die. Um, and so we <laughs> then get consulted at psychiatry and come and figure this out and say, hey, it's what's going on? Is this um, real? Are you really suicidal? How long are you going to act on this? Is this something you said because you're having back pain? Um, so, which <laughs> sometimes, you know. So, um, so that's another way we get our patients is by consulting, um, getting consulted from the main ER. Um, and then patients, once they come to see us, they get a medical screening exam. So make sure that nothing medically wrong, there's nothing medically wrong with them. Um, sometimes patients will come in um, and have a medical complaint in addition to a psychiatric complaint and they have to see a medical provider first um, to rule out that there's no medical condition that's causing the, the kind of psychiatric complaint. Um, and then once all that's done, then we, they get evaluated by a psychiatric provider and, a, and or a social worker. So either um, a psychiatrist or a PA or a nurse practitioner or a social worker. Gotcha. Um, we had a question about uh, involuntary admission. Does it violate patient autonomy or is there a criteria to allow involuntary admission? So um, involuntary to the emergency department is not quite the same as involuntary to um, an inpatient unit. So when they get brought in involuntarily to the emergency room, um, that's more of like a 48 to 72 hour hold. Um, so legally we are as an emergency department allowed to hold them in, in our um, ER for up to 48 to 72 hours while we assess the situation and see if they do require inpatient admission or if they're safe to be discharged. Um, if we do decide that a patient is um, in a dangerous situation or just sick enough to need inpatient admission, um, and if they choose not to, then we can do what's called an or file an order of protective custody, which is a legal document that goes to a judge um, where we um, ask the judge to extend this patient's stay so that um, we can extend their care. Um, and so that, that's different from just hold, uh, having a hold in the emergency department. Gotcha. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. um, and so then once we see the patient, whether it's in the emergency department, um, in the main emergency department, whether it's in our intake area, um, then we kind of decide where does this patient need to go? Um, do, are they okay to go back home or to their shelter? Are they okay to follow up outpatient? Um, is this patient sick enough that they need to come over to the psychiatric emergency department and stay with us for a little while, um, get started on medications, um, get some observation? Um, <clears throat> or are they medically sick and also having a psychiatric issue, but they need to stay in the main ER while they finish their medical workup? Um, or is this patient so sick that I think right now they probably need to go to, the, to an inpatient unit? Um, so those are kind of the, um, the, the ways patients leave our emergency, our psychiatric emergency department. Gotcha. Um, so when my night starts um, is, I, so I work Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night at, um, in the emergency department. Um, and so Friday, 3 p.m. is when my day starts. Um, and I kind of wanted to set this up to how, um, kind of give it a real life experience as much as possible so, um, if you were actually coming in to shadow me in the emergency room. Um, so you would hopefully have slept Friday <laughs> during the day and then uh, been ready to stay up all night. So 3 p.m., you know, I usually 
get up, I'll take my dogs out for a run. I will do some meditation um, and kind of just prepare for work, um, do some positive affirmations. I think all of those things are really important, um, especially if you're going to work in a high stress area. <laughs> so uh, then by 645, I get to the hospital and I get handoff from the previous provider. So he's been taking care of these patients um, over throughout the day. And now I'm going to take over from him. So him or her will give me kind of a rundown of what's going on with the patient, what needs to be done, what are we waiting for, what um, essentially what the state of what's going on. Um, so we show up at 10, 6.45, we get handoff from day shift and it turns out we've got 10 patients on our list. Um, one of them is gonna be transferring to an inpatient unit. Uh, looks like one of them is being discharged and we have one new patient that needs to be seen still. So that's 6.45, then we sit down about 7 p.m. and start chart reviewing. Um, so like I said, I spend most of my time sitting in front of the computer with these patients who are um, very mentally ill. Most of your information is going to come from chart reviewing. Um, so patients don't always give you all the information. They don't always, they don't want to talk to you sometimes. They can't talk to you. Um, they can't give you the information they don't remember. So a lot of what we do is investigative work, um, digging through the past, digging through the patient's previous encounters. Um, what did they look like, you know, last week? What did they look like a year ago, two years ago? Kind of gives us an idea of what's going on with the patient um, today. So that starts, we start chart reviewing is the first thing we do when we get there. And then that also kind of gives us an idea of who needs to be seen and when, um, who's really sick, who's acting out, <laughs> who, um, who just got here, um, who hasn't been seen in a while. So all of that gets done um, at the beginning of the shift. So that way you can kind of plan ahead. Um, and then at 7.45, you start hearing shouting from the day room. So the day room is where patients um, are kept um, for observation. Um, and so they're kind of separated from the providers and staff by a glass. Um, and so the, and they're in a locked unit, so they're not allowed to leave. Um, and so things sometimes can get rowdy. <laughs> you know, if you can imagine a lot of mentally ill patients kind of hanging out for long periods of time that can, things happen. So 7.45, we're doing our chart review and then we start hearing yelling from the day room and we look out and uh, it's our patients. <laughs> so it's our time to go and, and deal with them. So you can uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, so we find out the patient A is the one screaming um, and he is a 24 year old male and he came in under a mental illness warrant um, so what that is, is a uh, legal document where a family member or a concerned uh, party goes to the police department or goes to a, a law enforcement and say, says, hey, I'm concerned this patient is having a mental illness um, and that's affecting either the way they're operating, it's affecting their functioning and they are becoming dangerous to themselves or to other people. Um, and then the officer or the, um, uh, the law enforcement will go and find this patient and bring them in for a psychosocial assessment. So in this instance, this 24 year old male uh, had a mental illness warrant filed by his grandfather. Um, this patient was having paranoid delusions, talking to himself at home, um, aggressive behavior. So paranoid delusions, he was concerned that people were out to get him. He was afraid his family was out to get him. Um, so if you can imagine that can make you very scared um, if you think your own family is turning against you. So because of that, he was being very aggressive at home. Um, and then they also found him talking to himself a lot. Um, and you, you'll hear this a lot in, in psychiatry. Um, oh, he's talking to himself. Um, and, and for us, that means they're having some kind of hallucination going on that they're responding to. Um, and so he's kind of exhibiting all the signs of psychosis. Um, he had a urine drug screen and it turned out to be positive for cannabinoids, um, which is an ingredient in marijuana. So he's positive for that, which we thought, okay, maybe that's why he was acting kind of crazy was this marijuana was triggering it, right? Um, but after 40 hours in our emergency department, he didn't show any improvement. So the thought that maybe this is marijuana, maybe there's something more than marijuana um, was starting to come up um, and he was still being very aggressive. So they filed for him an order of protective custody, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. 
um, with plans for him to go to the hospital. So that's uh, the patient that's screaming. <laughs> um, before we move on, I wanted to just kind of give a little um, blurb about cannabis and psychosis. There's not a lot of um, research that has definitively said marijuana causes psychosis. There is a lot of association of a marijuana with psychosis. Um, and so we do know that there are both pro-psychotic and anti-psychotic compounds in marijuana. Um, we also know that high THC products can actually affect the way your brain develops, um, especially in younger um, populations. So kids you know, younger than 21 years old, it's, it, we see that a lot. Um, and we also know that long-term use of marijuana can lead to increased risk of schizophrenia in those people who have a uh, genetic vulnerability. Um, and also I've read some studies that say, um, if you are a heavy marijuana user, you can kind of um, have early onset psychosis. So not, we don't exactly know if that is triggering the psychosis or if that psychosis would have happened later on in life with or without you smoking marijuana. So um, that's, those are just some of the things that we are starting to learn about. And I think it's important to know because there is this big movement toward legalizing marijuana. Um, and uh, you may think it's, it's harmless in some situations and in a lot of cases for a lot of people it is, um, but for the few who have this underlying uh, vulnerability to psychosis, it can definitely make things worse. Hey Chris, it's Fowler again. You mentioned about getting an order of protective custody from the judge. Can you comment about how close a relationship you have to have with courts to be able to file such things as orders of protective custody? I suspect it's a regular thing for you, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I don't um, personally speak to or know any judges, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but they do work very closely with Parkland itself. Um, and so Dallas County judges, um, we have a magistrate that's open 24 hours seven to us. So when a patient comes in and does need that order of protective custody, we can get it done pretty quickly. Um, we are slowly starting to figure out some of the kinks with some of the surrounding counties like Navarro County and Denton County. Um, we have had some issues working with these smaller courts um, to, just because, especially on a night shift, I mean, we just don't have, um, they just don't have anybody in the office. Um, so we do work pretty closely with them, but I think we're still, there's still a lot of room for, for growth and improvement there. Chris, uh, on a different subject, do we have an abundance of available inpatient beds for psychiatric patients or is there a need for more beds? Um, we definitely do not have an abundance of beds. Um, and I think as you kind of know, uh, when our psychiatric emergency department fills up, they kind of spill over into the main department and start folding beds in the main ED. Um, and a lot of times we've had patients staying in our psychiatric emergency department for four or five days on in waiting for an inpatient bed to open up. So in Texas, especially, we are lacking severely in inpatient beds for psychiatry patients. And so part of your care is that you're also feeding them, they, they're able to sleep there in the, in, in the psychiatric um, facility there uh, in the ER, right? Yeah, and a lot, and sometimes too, I've had cases where um, a patient, it, 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 in a sense, it turns into a, um, an in-between of ER stability and inpatient unit. You know, I had a patient where plan was to go to the hospital, but he ended up staying with us for so long um, we were able to stabilize him in the emergency room and he ended up, that order of protective custody got lifted um, and he was actually able to go home. Um, so I think that may actually be the way um, the future of, of psychiatry is, is figuring out an in-between, um, if not being able to get more inpatient beds. It was about four or five years ago that uh, the state of Texas actually closed one of the large inpatient facilities and we lost about 200 inpatient beds. It was a facility halfway to Austin. And that was a real tough burden for us there in Parkland, New York. I've heard the, the, the stories of kind of how um, insanely busy the place was right after that shutdown. It's unfortunate. Um, okay, Rachel, we can go to the next one if there's not any other questions. I think, uh... We're good, let's just keep on rolling. Okay, um, so patient A, our, our guy um, smoking the, the marijuana, <laughs> is found yelling obscenities in the day room. So he's out there yelling up a storm. 
Um, this can get potentially dangerous because he can start to affect other patients. Um, a lot of our patients are sensitive to stimulus. So if this patient is getting very agitated, very loud, that is a safety risk for everybody involved. So we try to verbally de-escalate the patient. Um, and so that's kind of the least restrictive way of, of addressing uh, issues. Uh, we try to go and talk to the patient, see if there's anything we can provide um, to help them relax, whether it's you know an extra snack, an extra blanket, maybe just some quiet time. Um, whether they need to, you know, take a walk. Um, we, we try to do as much as we can just by talking with the patient before we resort to other types of things like medication or restraints. Um, ultimately with this patient, we tried to verbally deescalate multiple times. We tried to redirect, we took him out into the hallway. Um, he was given, you know, time to kind of relax, um, but ultimately required medication um, and so, we, that does happen. Uh, patients will require either injections or pills, um, and they take those either willingly or sometimes unwillingly um, if we have to give those. Um, and so I think the next slide I have talks about when it's appropriate to um, restrain a patient. Um, so of course, verbal de-escalation is the first thing we always want to do. When that doesn't work, we start to offer medication. Um, we offer pills and then we um, then injections and then if those things don't work, oftentimes patients have to be physically restrained. Um, and so usually the only time that is indicated is when a patient's behavior is jeopardizing the immediate safety of everyone involved, um, whether that's the patient attempting to harm themselves, um, which we see a lot of the times we get a lot of head banging, um, which can be very uh, traumatic. And then patients trying to fight staff We've got, we actually have had patients um, physically assault staff before, so that's not unheard of, um, which is why we take it kind of serious um, when there's a threat. Um, so putting them in this chair is one of the, um, is one of the indications when, when there's a safety issue. I will say I have been in this chair. <laughs> I, when I started training, because um, you have to learn how to directly, how to properly put the patient in the chair, um, once we were done with training, I requested to be put in the chair so I know what it felt like um, for a patient. And it, for somebody who was not in a mental health crisis um, and who, you know, willingly went in the chair, it had definitely caused some increased anxiety. So I can only imagine what it does to, to a patient um, when, they're, when they're in it. So uh, just something to consider. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool that you're like in your patient's shoes and whatnot so yeah. you understand where they're coming from and when they're in the chair. Yeah, I think it really helps. Uh, it helps you understand what they're going through. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, we go, we're done talking uh, with uh, our patient A. So we have to come back and order all of our medications. So on our way back from seeing patient A, patient B um, stops you and says, hey, I'm having some back pain. I, I need some medication. So we have to stop and we see patient B on our way back to doing our, um, putting in our admission orders um, and our medication orders. Um, and then we also have our new patient that we need to see. So 8.30 comes around, we finally get to our new patient who's probably been waiting about two hours now to see a provider at this point. Um, and so we go out and see the new patient and that takes us, yeah, it looks like about an hour, almost give or take to get the assessment done. Um, and we probably didn't even finish because it looks like we got pulled to the phone to do what's called a doc to doc to transfer our patient B to an inpatient unit. So lots of moving parts happening in the emergency room. Um, so even though we're psych, you're still managing multiple patients, you're having to do multiple things. Um, you're getting interrupted by seeing patients, but you're still expected to, to do your job and, and, and do it well. So it is very challenging in that sense. But if you're um, good at being organized, if you like being organized, if you like planning, um, I think working in the emergency room setting is, is conducive to that. Um, and then I put a note about COVID-19 just because I think um, that's one way that's changed um, some of our practices is now every single patient that comes through the door has to have a COVID-19 test. Um, whereas I probably wouldn't even have to put any orders in on a patient if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic um, yeah. until after I see them. But because this is a new patient right through the door, been sitting here for two hours, 
we need to have this COVID test <laughs> um, before we can continue um, to allow them to sit in our unit. Um, and this has kind of been a, an area of contention for us because a lot of times psychotic patients don't understand um, the necessity of, of getting these kinds of tests done. And especially to stick mm -hmm. something up their nose can be very traumatic for these patients. Um, so a lot of times we have trouble even getting these tests done. Gotcha. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a like a struggle. It, it's an issue every day. I think it's a fight with at least one patient <laughs> who refuses to do the test, um, and then that again backs up our our admissions process. So, um, so that can be challenging as well. <laughs> um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so our new patient, we'll talk a little bit about her. Um, so she's a 22 year old female that got brought in under an emergency detention. So that means she got brought in by police officers um, and we can legally hold her up to 48 hours um, to determine if she needs any kind of um, attention, uh, treatment. So she got brought in for acute alcohol intoxication and suicidal ideation. So in her drunken state, she had made some claims of not wanting to be alive anymore. Um, she came in to see us very loud. She was slurring her words. She was unsteady gait. When we asked her about suicidal ideation and she wouldn't re respond, but when we asked her if she wanted to, to continue to live, she said, what's the point? Um, so she kind of made us concerned that she was feeling suicidal. Um, she also is heavily intoxicated as indicated by the way she's kind of slurring and stumbling. Um, and also police said that she had been drinking when they picked her up. Um, and so I put the little infographic here about the short-term effects of drinking alcohol um, and kind of how, it, uh, um, how you determine that in, in um, a clinical setting, um, because we do have to justify, again, what we're seeing. Um, so one thing that we want to consider when a patient comes in uh, intoxicated with alcohol, um, it's one of the substances that can be very, very uh, life-threatening. Um, in almost the immediate setting, um, you know, patients can easily overdose on alcohol or alcohol poisoning, but more importantly, they can go in through alcohol withdrawal, which can lead to um, some serious uh, side effects. Uh, so what we do is put them under a clinical institute withdrawal assessment of alcohol scale. So it's, it's called a CWA essentially. And what all we're doing is like monitoring her symptoms um, and we're monitoring her vitals and her blood pressure um, and seeing how she's doing um, as this night is progressing, because you know we want to make sure she's not going to start having symptoms from withdrawing from alcohol, because we don't really know when her last drink was. Um, we don't really know how much she drinks, um, but heavy drinkers who go through withdrawals um, can have some symptoms that are pretty life-threatening. So we definitely want to monitor that. Um, unfortunately, when we went and met with her, we didn't get a lot of information. She was too intoxicated to tell us how much she drank. She was too intoxicated to tell us if she'd had any symptoms of withdrawals in the past, um, because that is a risk factor for, again, developing withdrawal symptoms and mm -hmm. having previously. Um, so unfortunately for us, she wasn't able to give us any information. Um, so we have to get collateral information, which is something we do a lot in psychiatry. Um, like I said, your patient isn't always gonna be able to tell you a history. Um, so collateral information is very, very important. Um, and that requires calling um, a family member or calling um, a loved one, um, a roommate, somebody that knows the patient well, um, that can kind of vouch for them and say, hey, no, this is not how they normally act. They have been you know, out of control or they've been drinking more than usual. Or they can say, yes, this happens all the time. I think they're totally fine. They just had a bad night, they can come home. Um, so that collateral information is really important for us in determining what we're gonna do next with the patient. Um, so that is uh, an, a really important aspect in psychiatry. Gotcha. Hey, you know, um, uh, hey, you know uh, it's interesting, Chris, that I see a lot of emergency docs that I work with that don't get blood alcohols. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a test that I draw a lot because I think you learn a great deal from that, for example. If you get someone with slurred speech and acting kind of weird and their blood alcohol is zero, that's one thing. Or yeah. if you get someone who really is talking very normally and you get a blood alcohol and, and it's 300, you know that they're a chronic alcoholic who drinks all the time because they've accommodated to that level of alcohol. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I think that's really important. I think sometimes patient uh, providers are reluctant to draw a blood alcohol level because then you have proof that this patient is intoxicated. So when they're clinically sober, you can't, you know, technically discharge them because their blood alcohol level indicates they're still drunk. <laughs> um, so I think you get a lot of uh, hesitation there, but I do think it is important. Um, it kind of, like you're saying, I mean, you, you want to be sure. Um, and, and I think that having that blood alcohol level makes us sure that that's what we're seeing is, is alcohol intoxication. You're mentioning a blood alcohol level here of 285 for the folks that are almost 300 people who are with us. Uh, to get a blood alcohol of 300, we'll say, you have to drink an entire fifth of liquor on an empty stomach in one hour. Can you imagine how drunk you would be? So here is a woman who's awake and alert. She has some slurred speech, but she has enormous alcohol consumption. Yeah, which tells us that she's a heavy drinker, right? Like she, this is not her first rodeo. This is not her first, um, she wasn't like out having cocktails with the girls, like this girl <laughs> drinks. Um, and so, and mom kind of information confirmed that, right? Mom told us, yes, yeah, she's been drinking a lot more since she dropped out of college. Um, that's all she does is stay home and drink. And so we kind of have an idea that this woman is somebody who can potentially go into alcohol withdrawal. So she's somebody that I want to keep a close eye on. Even in psychiatry, you know, yes, she's here for most likely suicidal ideations. That's most likely why police were called, but alcohol abuse is also falls under um, treatment in psychiatry. Um, and then as a medical, you know, as a provider, her life is in our hands. So we also have to take that medical um, consideration. You're also reporting that already with a blood alcohol approaching 300, she feels shaky now. So this is someone who is at a huge risk of going into alcohol withdrawal. And I hope you're gonna cover a little bit about what you're about to say about DTs and so forth. Yeah, definitely. So um, we wanna kind of keep, a tr keep an eye on her. Um, so if you look at the alcohol withdrawal timeline here, it kind of gives us an idea of what to expect um, as you progress in your withdrawal from alcoholism or from alcohol. So within the first eight hours, you start to get that, you know, fatigue, a little bit of anxiety, some nausea. Um, you may start to get a little bit of tremors here. Um, but as your withdrawal progress within the first one to three days going without alcohol, you start to develop kind of psychotic symptoms. You can start to hallucinate, you can be confused um, and more um, life-threatening. You can develop seizures, um, your vital signs can start to become unstable and that starts to push us into what's called delirium tremens, um, which can be very life-threatening. Um, you, this, if you look at this girl here, she's already got a heart rate of 105. She's starting to get a little anxious. She's reporting feeling shaky. So these are things that are kind of starting make, putting her at risk for developing these delirium tremens. Um, and that is something that needs to be, you know, either admitted to the ICU or at least transferred over to the Dr. Fowler so he can keep an eye on her while she continues to withdraw from alcohol. Um, but we give her a little bit of Librium, um, which is a benzodiazepine. So it's a downer just like alcohol. And you may wonder why do we give that to somebody who's already drinking, you know, already drunk? Um, well, the idea is when you're a heavy alcohol drinker, you have so much of this you know, downer in your system, going without it is a shock to the system. And it throws your system immediately back into up and down and up and down. And so we try to give more downer so that we can kind of slowly taper, um, taper off. Um, and so that, so that ideal, hopefully will start to improve her symptoms um, and prevent her from going into this, the withdrawal like delirium tremens. Somebody said, sweet heck, how is this woman functioning? <laughs> yeah, you, you'd be surprised at how many people um, come in severely intoxicated who are upright. <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty shocking. It's crazy. Also, I love all the visuals. I'm so <laughs> fan. Um, and so again, I just wanted to bring attention to something I think is kind of important, um, college student drinking, uh, binge drinking, which I, and I, it says college student, but I think a lot of people are, are um, guilty of binge drinking, um, which is, you know, having five or more drinks in two hours if you're a male or four or more drinks in two hours if you're a female. Um, and I think a lot of people are very guilty of that at one point or another. 
Um, so I just wanted to bring attention to kind of the dangers it poses. Um, well, one, a lot of you guys are college students. So already we're, you're at an increased risk of drinking more than anybody else in your age group. Um, and, but also you're at an increased risk of binge drinking, which can put you at risk of a lot of negative consequences. So you can, you know, accidents are really huge when you're binge drinking. So whether that's um, car accidents, whether that's getting assaulted, whether that's getting sexually assaulted, um, falling down the stairs. I mean, you could really injure yourself when you're binge drinking. Also, um, binge drinking can lead to a lot of academic problems, legal issues. It also puts you at an increased risk for developing alcohol use disorder like alcoholism. Um, kind of the way marijuana can um, is associated with increased risk of psychosis. Same thing with binge drinking. Um, you can definitely put yourself at risk for alcoholism in the future. So it's important to know what a standard drink is um, because I think sometimes we like to fudge the idea of what a standard drink is. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's just one glass, but it's like a glass that's the same. <laughs> it's the whole bottle. Right. So <laughs> I think knowing what a standard drink is is really important. Um, so what they uh, what's listed here is a 12 ounce beer with 5% alcohol content. So most beers nowadays, especially if you're doing craft beers, have way more than 5% alcohol content. Um, so really make sure you're looking at that when you're having a drink, um, if you're going to have more than one. Um, also wine, uh, five ounce glass of wine is the recommended amount. Um, most wines are 12%, but it's the, uh, the pour is usually the problem when it comes to wine. Um, people tend to over pour when it comes to wine. So be careful with that. Um, and then with liquor, a, a single drink is 1.5 ounces of liquor. So use a shot glass, use a measuring cup, like don't just count it out and wing it because um, you're probably <laughs> over serving yourself. <laughs> so that's just my little um, spiel on college student drink and binge drinking. So. Gotcha. Um, okay, so then finally we are done seeing that patient. We, we've attended to her needs. Um, we've saw everybody else. Um, by 11.45, we are completing paperwork. We're charting on everybody. We're completing chart review on patients we haven't seen yet. We're going back and reassessing patients. Um, so, you know, it, we're pretty busy in the night, whether it's on the computer, whether it's filling out forms to get a patient transferred inpatient, um, or whether it's going back and actually talking to patients and seeing if they need anything. Um, and then by 12.45 in the morning, we can finally have lunch. Um, we can discuss cases. And I definitely, definitely need another cup of coffee at this point. Um, what's kind of nice about working in the hospital and in the ER is that you get these lulls, you get kind of um, moments where you're super, super busy, and then you get moments where you have some time to kind of relax and, and you know, take a walk. Um, I like to do the stairs in our, um, in our building, so I'll run up and down the stairs and get some exercise in, or we'll go for a walk. Um, so that's what I, I like about being in the hospital. And then um, 4.45 is time to kind of go back. Oh, sorry, I did not finish a thought. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 4.45, we go back and we reassess any patients that are probably going to be up for discharge or anybody that needs to be seen um, for that day. That's probably right where we're um, starting to wrap things up. Um, and then at 6 a.m., we start preparing for our next shift. Um, our patient, or our, we know our next provider is about to come on. So what I try to do is wrap up any loose ends, um, try to get a good list of what needs to be done next. Uh, that way they have a good understanding of, of what's going on with these patients. And then at 6.45, we get our relief. Our next provider comes in and I have to give handoff to the patient or to the provider. Usually the provider that comes in after me is a, um, a psychiatrist, so an MD or a DO. Um, and Parkland psych department is really good about doing um, shifts where we switch off like that. So one team um, we'll have a PA or a nurse practitioner, and then following that shift will be an MD or a DO, and then following that shift will be a, a, a PA or an NP, so that the patient is always getting seen by an MD or DO and a mid-level or a PA slash NP. So I think that's kind of cool um, that Parkland does that and that this patient is getting kind of comprehensive team care. Uh, um, Chris, I know that our residents at Parkland uh, cannot sign off to a resident that is um, uh, in, in earlier training. For example, a third year can't si cannot sign out to an intern. Uh, can you sign out to another PA or to another mid-level? Yes. Yeah, we definitely can. Um, it's, not, um, it's not against the rules. 
Um, we definitely can, can do that if we need to, but Parkland tries to have at least a, a patient be seen by both a PA or NP and a, a psychiatrist. Awesome. I love how there's just such a great collaborative teamwork environment that you're working in. Yeah. And, um, and then the social workers also like they'll, they'll give handoff to their next social worker that's coming in to relieve them. So the patient is really getting, you know, three different types of, of, of care. Um, so that's really, really awesome. Uh, and then we're done by 7 a.m. I clock out, I go home. Um, this is a picture of the uh, sunset that I get or the sunrise that I get to see on my way home. So I just wanted to include that there. Uh, so working in nights is not all bad. <laughs> you get little moments like this. <laughs> you don't get as much traffic. You don't get as much traffic. Um, parking is really easy when I get to the hospital. Uh, the, the hospital is a little quiet, um, quieter than it is during the day. Um, so it, it's got its perks. And I, I definitely have adjusted well to it. <laughs> That's good. Um, and then just some uh, kind of closing thoughts about uh, balancing work and life. Uh, like I said, I do a minimum of three 12 hour shifts a week. So I do Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. I chose to do those, those shifts um, because I, um, I am crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I chose that shift, but um, I, I think it works out well for me. I get to have uh, I'm off by 7 a.m. on Monday, and I don't go back to work until Friday at 6.45 p.m. So during the week, I can, you know, run errands. I help my grandparents out a lot, so I take them to doctor's appointments. Um, so it really works out well for me. And then, you know, working nights, if you are flexible, if your family is open and flexible, I think it's a good option. Uh, just because there's a pay differential, it's more laid back. So I prefer to do it. Um, but it, it definitely requires cooperation and patience on your family's part as well. Because you are, you know, when I go into work on Friday and I don't get off till Monday morning at seven, it kind of feels like a blur. I don't really see my family. I don't really get much time to do anything other than like exercise, eat, sleep, shower, and get back to work. <laughs> So if you're wanting to do shift work, if you're gonna do nights, um, I would recommend you know talking it over with your family. Um, and if you don't have any responsibilities, then all the more reason to do it. <laughs> um, and then again, you, you know, make sure you love what you do because if you don't, it, you're not gonna enjoy any any part of it. Um, patients are gonna pick that up. Um, you're gonna be miserable. That's gonna transfer over to your family. Like just make sure you really love what you do. Um, hey, Chris, and, um, Chris, do you, uh, do you flip your days back around when you're off for a few days? I do. Um, so yeah, I definitely do. So if I get off at Monday at seven, I will try and stay up as long as possible. Um, and then maybe take a nap, but then that way, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm up during the day. Um, and I can kind of do, see my husband and, uh, get stuff done. So I do flip back. Um, I don't know how long that's going to, uh, I'm going to be successful with that. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, as I get older, it doesn't start to take a toll, but for now it works out. I worked um, a lot of nights for many, many years. I'm talking, God, 25 years or longer. You know, I, and I really kind of liked the nights. I, I felt that there was a sense of independence at nights that I was, in a way, sort of really required to be on my A game all the time because there were fewer people there um, in the emergency department. So, um, and then of course, uh, in a way you might say crazier people come out at night. So I kind of enjoyed the emergency department just because <laughs> of the patient population that you saw. I agree with that. And I think that's probably part of the reason I chose to do um, weekend nights also was because I was hoping I would get a little bit more action. <laughs> um, but, you know, the other thing I would say, if you're going to do shift work, if you're going to work in a high stress environment, like the emergency room is um, learn to set priorities. Uh, you know, for me, priorities are, are my family, are my health. Um, so making sure I'm getting a run in, making sure I'm spending quality time with my family, making sure I'm still having time to volunteer. Um, those are all things that I, I have to get done. Um, so I make those a priority. 
So Chris, the, the, the mental health population that we see at Parkland is enormously difficult. Some are somewhat straightforward illnesses. We'll get the occasional bipolar that's simply off meds and needs to be you know, restarted and, and with the anticipation that should do fairly well. But we see such chronicity of substance abuse and uncontrolled schizophrenia mixed with homelessness and very difficult family situations. How do you keep from getting, I don't know, a little frustrated or a little sense that maybe we don't make a lot of progress sometimes? Yeah, um, I think I, I see that a lot, um, actually, which is kind of surprising. But um, I think for me, it's about being present. Um, it's about dealing, about doing what I can with the patient uh, right in front of me and remembering that this patient is sick um, and this patient is here kind of at, at their worst, um, one of the lowest points of their life. And to be able to just hold space for that patient um, and let them know that, hey, we're still here, someone is still here, I think um, is, is kind of what I try to hold on to, to instead of going down this path of negativity, because really that's not helping anybody. <laughs> and um, I said this to you before the, we started this evening. I'm always impressed, you know, because in, on the medical side and trauma side of the ER where I am, um, we often come across these mentally ill patients that we are clearing medically. And I find myself very often getting pretty frustrated or just sort of at wits in, especially when we're very, very busy. And yet you guys come over and y'all are very methodical. You're very, uh, very to the point. You work your way carefully through the situation. And I'm always very impressed with the patience that you show. You don't get flustered. You don't seem to get annoyed. You may get annoyed, but you don't show it. <laughs> Uh, so could you comment about the interactions that you have on the medical side because you know we we're in a partnership and we have to clear the patient so that you can then uh pursue their mental illness piece yeah i um i think we rely heavily on our um on the medical side on the medical providers uh because i think when you're in a specialty you can kind of get one track minded um, and in psychiatry, there are a lot of uh, medical mimics. So I think we relying heavily on them to, to clear a patient and to make sure we're not missing anything is really important. Um, and also making sure we have good communication because like I said, a lot of our patients do end up staying in the main side of the ER. Um, and I think they can be kind of difficult for the medical team to handle because it's not something they do very often. Um, but it, having open lines of communication between us and the medical team, um, I think helps for a smoother transition um, to, to, so everybody's in the loop, everybody knows what's going on with this patient and what the plan is. Um, and that way nobody really feels like um, they're getting uh, dumped on essentially. <laughs> so what's, uh, what's, what's next for you then? Precepting, what is that about? Yeah, so precepting is like um, having a student, essentially. I've got a nurse practitioner that actually works over in OGs. So that's the um, OBGYN emergency services uh, it, it, over in Parkland. And there's a nurse practitioner who wants to come to psychiatry. So she's emailed me and I think we're going to get together and hopefully um, I might start uh, letting her come in and, and, and shadow me. And essentially precepting is, is shadowing for a grade. Uh, she's learning how to do psychiatry. She's practicing psychiatry um, now so she can go and get her license um, and become a, a practice, a, a mental health practitioner. Um, so that's kind of next on the list. The other thing is getting a um, level of qualification in psychiatry. It's just something that's offered to PAs. Um, these are extra certifications we can get after a year of experience to kind of just add to our resume that show, hey, we know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, and then also, I think getting involved in mental health policy is something I'm interested in doing, um, especially at the local level at Parkland. I think one of the ideas I have, uh, there's a, a, a real lack of funding for mental health service, especially for our, our uh, patients at Parkland. Um, and one thing I, I'd like to see done is our Parkland Financial Services extend their, um, their, their financial help to patients with mental health needs. Um, so that might be something um, in my future that I'm trying to, to fight for. <laughs> what, what about uh, getting a master's? Any thought about going further in terms of your uh, uh, academic degree? 
I think the um, one thing I might consider going back and doing um, would be like in education um, to, to learn how to be a better educator in PA uh, and for PA students. I think that's something that I might do um, kind of down the line when I'm uh, either no longer able to or no longer interested in practicing clinically. Um, I think teaching is going to be the next thing. I think we can all attest that you would be an amazing teacher and amazing mental health advocate. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, and there's just an FYI, Mental Health Month uh, is in May. And so you can go to the, I think it's the National Alliance of Mental Illness. They have all kinds of little like memes and, and pictures and stuff you can just kind of post on social media to show that you are a mental health advocate and you, um, you know, people aren't alone. Yeah. Um, and then I think I've got one other PSA, which is uh, uh, just about the COVID vaccine. Um, just if you can, if you're able to, please consider getting the vaccine. Um, I would really love for all of us to be able to um, get together again. So everyone get vaccinated. <laughs> and, Chris, and Chris, to follow that on, it looks like the supply of vaccine is now exceeding the demand for vaccine, at least in the United States. And so it should be for those that have not been vaccinated, that the vaccine should be much more available now. Yeah, definitely. I um I got a actually a text message from a text message from one of the clinics I used to work at in Dallas that said they definitely have some in stock. So <laughs> it's out there, guys. Go get it. Beautiful. Well, I hope you can spare us a couple more minutes. I know we've been talking for a while, but we still have lots of questions. Yeah, no, definitely. I have nowhere to be. So <laughs> well, thank you for joining us tonight. I think uh, a great question is what constitutes psychiatric treatment? Does it always involve medication? No, that's such a good question. It does not. Um, sometimes not treating is the best option for a patient. Um, you know, I have patients sometimes too that definitely could benefit from a medication, but it isn't necessarily um, something that I think they will continue or it's not something they're entirely on board with, then, you know, that's not something I want to push on a patient if that means that they're not going to, um, if they, it may deter them from seeking help in the future. So sometimes not treating um, can be just as successful as, as treating a patient, which is prescribing a medication. Gotcha. Um... Have you ever dealt with uh, patients whose religious beliefs don't allow you to act on the situation? Um, I don't, so it, it's interesting because in, in psychiatry, you get patients who are um, bipolar, who get in manic episodes. And part of, one of the symptoms is becoming hyper-religious. Um, so they start talking about God and um, you know all kinds of religiosity religious themes and, and, and sometimes they can use that as a, as a way to want to deter treatment, but if we can recognize that as part of their psychosis and not a true uh, religious belief. Um, I have not actually had the, um, the experience of a patient beliefs uh, where they were not psychotic and chose not to take medication, um, but I have experienced it in the sense of, of uh, psychosis. Gotcha. Um, what's the best solution for a seriously mentally ill transient who struggles with medicine compliance once they're back on the street? I think, um, so we see this a lot. Um, we, we have a lot of patients who are, you know, have schizophrenia and really have a hard time taking their medication. Um, and a lot of them end up homeless chronically. Um, one of the solutions that we try to offer is something called a long-term, a long-acting injectable. Um, so these are antipsychotic medications that a patient can get that last um, one month or three months long. Um, and sometimes that helps with compliance. Um, another thing I think that uh, we, we don't have, but I think is definitely needed in psychiatry is a place for patients like that um, who are transient, who are chronically uh, non-compliant. Um, they need a place where they can show up as, um, as needed. They, they need more of a walk-in center because so many of these patients um, have trouble maintaining an appointment. They have make trouble making an appointment. They have trouble sitting and waiting to be seen. Um, and so there's so many barriers for them to just get in to see the psychiatrist that I think the system itself needs to change that to meet these patients where they're at. 
I can already tell you're just going to be such a good advocate. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, one of the students wants a little bit more clarification. How do you differentiate between psychosis and true religious belief? Um, I think that uh, goes into looking at the whole of the patient. So um, if this patient, you know, is coming in, showing other signs of mania, um, showing other signs uh, of psychosis, then we can kind of make an educated guess that that's the most likely um, cause of that happening. Um, whereas this may actually, this very well may be their underlying religious belief. However, they are not an, um, in a state of mind where they can use those justifications or make any kind of justification to deter treatment. Gotcha. And then uh, do you deal with a lot of patients that are aware they can get different types of drugs in the ER and manipulate themselves in a way to receive them? Yeah, I think this is a big, uh, a big thing we see in our emergency room, especially because we are a safety net hospital um, and because we're in a big city like Dallas, um, we see a lot of patients that um, come in quite frequently claiming psychiatric illnesses in, in exchange for wanting a place to sleep or wanting to get medication. Um, and so that can be kind of disheartening uh, because you, you do know that they're, they're coming in to take advantage of the system. Um, so at the same time, I try to understand that they're, this is still they're still struggling, right? Nobody comes in and takes advantage of a hospital system because they're living their best life. Like this is, um, there's still an underlying issue. Um, and, I, and I think that speaks to the larger systemic problems that we have with affordable housing and um, why patients feel the need to have to come and manipulate the system in that way. Gotcha. And then last couple of questions. Uh, do you feel like you're still fulfilled with the patient relationships you have in the ED? Uh, from an outside perspective, it seems like you don't get this. Do you feel like this is a misconception? I think, so it's funny because I did actually feel that way in the beginning. Um, when I first, coming from family medicine where people, patients were happy to see me, patients were excited to see me, they knew me. Um, we had just talked last week, we have developed this relationship. Um, and, and so going into psychiatry, I did feel like there was that piece missing. Um, however, the longer I've done it, the more I feel like I've been able to develop a rapport more quickly with a patient so that even though I only see them for a short amount of time, that short amount of time has been very meaningful um, to both of us. So I think uh, it's allowed me to to appreciate patients in a different way as opposed to wanting patients to appreciate me. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, thank you so much for answering some of our questions. Let me go to uh, the quiz real fast and then we'll say some closing thoughts. So yeah. let me just do this. Uh, here's the assessment for this week. Um, you can use your phone to just scan the QR code. We'll post it on our website. We'll post it in our Sunday email. And we'll also post it on our Instagram. You have two attempts to pass this exam. Um, it's due next Wednesday uh, at 7 p.m. or like 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. You know, the regular time. And um, But be sure to download the certificate uh, because when you download the certificate, it verifies in our system that, hey, you've gotten credit. Um, but yeah. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you for all of our students that have joined us and stayed online with us. Um, Crystal, you can see there's so many thank yous in the chat, and I've been watching the chat. They've just been saying so many positive things that you're such an inspiration, <laughs> your, your personality is so beautiful, and thank you so much for blessing us with your time tonight. Thank you guys for having me, and thank you guys for showing up. That's so awesome. Dr. Fowler, do you have any closing thoughts? Just want to thank you, Chris, so much. Um, uh, the hundreds of people that were with us tonight and the thousands will ultimately watch your video. We'll see probably 100,000 patients each in their career. Uh, and tonight you've affected ultimately hundreds of millions of lives with your grace and your kindness, uh, your amazing skill. And thank you for demonstrating to us uh, how to love those that are difficult to love sometimes. And a reminder to all of us to show patience and love and understanding because what we're doing is dealing with bettering the human condition. Chris, thank you. Thank you to the virtual shadowing team. And wanna thank all of you who came tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And on behalf of the, all the team, we wish you a good evening and a good night.
Goodbye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.